Thank you, Linda, for the nice words. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you, Facial Pain Association, for inviting me. It's uh, you're doing some wonderful, wonderful work, uh, really helping access to care and uh, taking on numerous initiatives. So uh, the field is appreciative of what you do. Uh, I do not have any uh, disclosures. So, all right. So we'll talk about orofacial pain, some basics. We'll talk about diagnosis, clinical case. Uh, we'll discuss a couple of cases and uh, we'll uh, kind of dive into treat uh, diagnosis and treatment. Uh, all right. So before I start, I uh, I think this is a great uh, introduction to kind of chronic pain, which is very different than uh, uh, dental pain or acute pain. And uh, Karen Davis for uh, International Association of Study of Pain did, did this video uh, several years and I'm, uh, people who have seen me have seen this lecture because I think it helps. I'm going to skip. Dr. Chanani, we are not able to hear the audio for this. Oh, you're not? Okay. No. Let's see. I apologize that, uh, so this is a video on how your brain responds to pain. I hope now you can hear the video. There is still no audio, unfortunately. Uh, all right, I'm going to skip the video. I'm sorry for technical issues. Uh, so, uh, I'm happy to share these slides and you could kind of uh, look at this video on your time because it, it gives you a really good understanding of why chronic pain is very different than acute pain and how different people react very differently to multiple stimulus. And uh, that's extremely important in uh, facial pain population or any chronic pain population. So, uh, that's a good way to kind of uh, introduce you all to the field of orofacial pain, which uh, is a new specialty recognized last year by the American Dental Association. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm lucky to be a specialist because of my uh, board certification and training. And uh, uh, orofacial pain training involves a fair bit of medicine, a little bit of neurology, a little bit of psychology, uh, which makes us prepared for uh, a kind of a complex scenario. And it's quite a bit different uh, and uh, which is interesting as well as stimulating. It's interesting because as you saw in the introduction video, uh, about 10% of people uh, population, adult population, suffer from, from TMJ disorders. And uh, if you include headaches, that number is a little higher. Uh, if you include chronic pain disorders, insomnia, uh, now that number is quite a bit. So on any given day, if you're seeing 20 odd patients, there is a good chance you're seeing one or two of uh, patients who are suffering from these conditions. Uh, so it's it makes it extremely important to be aware of these conditions. Uh, you'll be uh, pr providing a much uh, needed uh, 
diagnosis as well as treatment in a lot of these conditions. So the orofacial pain is unique because it kind of goes from uh, one of my uh, mentors uh, during my training used to say, uh, we pay attention to the tooth and the person attached to the tooth. So that's a good summary. Uh, we, we paying attention to psychology, to sleep medicine, to uh, the trigeminal system, as well as different uh, muscles, different uh, neck structures, nerves. So, uh, and it it really is beyond just the temporomandibular joint. Uh, in this, it all started with the temporomandibular joint, but uh, the field is much more involved. And uh, I really like like to think of it's more the brain than the trigeminal nerve or the dental structures when it comes to orofacial pain. Uh, it often starts with the trigeminal nerve or the uh, odontogenic uh, issue or pathology at times. Uh, this is a good schematic of uh, kind of putting different conditions uh, in a classification algorithm and uh, it splits into uni unilateral continuous pain versus unilateral episodic pain. Uh, and it talks about kind of mechanism for the most part, uh, going from neuralgias, it includes muscle pain, uh, persistent or facial muscle pain, burning mouth syndrome. Uh, and that's this sort of a classification is helpful because it gives you clues as to that uh, treatment strategies for each individual patients. Uh, so uh, tailoring kind of the diagnosis as well as the treatment is important in these patients. Uh, so uh, these are quite co uh, common conditions, especially muscle pain being 60 to 80 percent of temporomandibular disorders or poor facial pain uh, tends to be muscle pain. And then uh, the uncommon uh, conditions tends to be neuropathic pain, even trigeminal neuralgia, which happens in like 0.3 to 0.5 percent of people. Uh, it's so it's important to know uh, these conditions because uh, you will, as a dentist, you will see them quite common. Uh, unfortunately, most of these conditions, including muscle pain, the exact cause is not known. We really don't, uh, we have some sort of understanding of the mechanism involved, but we really don't know why certain people uh, suffer from this. Uh, I did my dental training in the 90s where uh, back in India, a lot of these conditions were blamed on stress or psychological factors, but now that, uh, theory has evolved. Stress, psychological in, uh, factors definitely play a strong role, but at the same time, it's not really the cause uh, in a lot of these patients. I'm sure there's some patients where it's, it's causing the problem, but for majority of patients, uh, there's multiple variables, and then those variables can include nutrition, it could include morphology, it could include uh, behaviors, it could include include kind of uh, medical comorbidities. Some patients have uh, autoimmune disorders. It's it's a laundry list of uh, uh, possibilities. So, uh, and that's, that's probably why uh, certain patients do tend to be a lot more severe because they have more variables compared to some other patients who are not as severe. All right, persistent idiopathic facial pain or atypical facial pain, it's a poorly understood kind of neuropathic pain conditions. It's essentially an, uh, a disorder of the neurolo neurogenic uh, component of the peripheral or central nervous system. So uh, we really, uh, for the most part, we, we think it's more the central nervous system rather than the peripheral nervous system. Uh, although the pain location is in the periphery typically uh, it could be a tooth or it could be uh, part of a tongue. Uh, so uh, several possibilities. 
and uh, international headache society has classified uh, has a classification criteria uh, which you could use they're kind of on the slides and uh, typically uh, there is a a fair amount of correlation with psych, psych disorder uh, so trigeminal neuralgia which is classically a clinical disorder uh, it's diagnosed with its clinical features. I would say most people who see, who've seen trigeminal neuralgia can diagnose it like this because it's uh, it's got this presentation of short electric like uh, I had a patient day before yesterday so she's like, I feel as if a drill is uh, kind of cutting into my bone. The pain is so deep. Uh, and so the, if you use patient's words, it's always a little bit different, And but it's really stands out. Uh, often at times pa patients will say, this is the worst kind of pain they've ever felt in their life. Uh, and not one patient. In my short career, I've seen a number of patients who, uh, say, oh, uh, this is kind of, I cannot imagine anything worse than this. And it's it's quite debilitating. Patients get disabled from this pain, especially with uh, increased frequency. Uh, it's almost always evoked. And when I say uh, almost always, I'm talking about idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia, which is uh, due to no unknown re no known reason. Uh, secondary trigeminal neuralgia or trigeminal neuralgia related to uh, uh, intracranial pathology may be more spontaneous. Uh, and typically it lasts for fractions of a second to like two minutes. Uh, the new definition does talk about a lingering pain in, in between attacks. So a patient can have almost constant pain with these electric shock-like intermittent uh, jabs. Uh, most of the times it, it's limited to one division of the trigeminal nerve, uh, but at times it may go to a second division, uh, but it always follows a nerve. So if a patient comes in where the pain is not limited to like uh, a pattern, but it's electric shock-like, it's it has to be diagnosed as neuropathic pain. Uh, and that's very important because 60 to 70% of trigeminal neuralgia patients do respond to kind of surgery, surgical interventions, while neuropathic pain, that number goes down to 30, close to placebo. So that's extremely important to have a diagnostic uh, uh, criteria to follow that. Uh, anytime the pain does not follow a path, uh, typically trigeminal neuralgia, you'll see trigger zones. It's almost always evoked. And uh, some people may, uh, classically, it's cold water, cold air on the face, which triggers the pain. Uh, some people, uh, it gets triggered with brushing, swallowing, uh, uh, shaving, uh, rubbing a towel on the face. So, But uh, there's definitely variations to that. Uh, and this is where uh, the dentist role comes really important. So over the years, uh, 40 per for about 40% of trigeminal neuralgia patients uh, undergo dental treatment uh, uh, and resulting in sometimes worsening of symptoms. So unnecessary dental procedures uh, as a consequence of trigeminal neuralgia is a big problem. Uh, this study, they found 48%. There's another study which found about 27% of trigeminal neuralgia patients had unnecessary dental procedures. So that is uh, uh, unfortunate. And at the same time, because trigeminal neuralgia, there's no clear diagnostic uh, test. So it's really the class, uh, clinical exam and clinical symptoms that determine the presence of this. Uh, often at times patients are frustrated and then of course uh, at times dentists can be frustrated too. They, uh, we as dentists, we want to help the patients by doing the right thing or 
at least providing some sort of a treatment. But at the same time, it's important to know if uh, it does not sound like a typical odontogenic pathology, including an objective test. It's better to kind of uh, get a second set of eyes and it could be a neurologist, it could be a oral surgeon, it could be orofacial pain. Uh, there are options who to uh, have a second opinion. Uh, so this uh, study in triple OE looked at uh, ineffective or unnecessary dental treatments with a neuropathic pain and uh, they found 36 patient 36 percent of patients it's a small study it's not a large study uh, but uh, around 50 odd patients but it's still a, a, a significant number of people who get these unnecessary procedures and often with not great results uh, 20% of headache patients have dental procedures in uh, headache and jaw pain. So this is really orofacial pain patients who have dental treatment, not classic headache patients, uh, one in five. So that's a big number. So it's important to kind of, again, uh, recognize this. Uh, 26 patients, again, same message. Uh, and this is a recent study. Uh, uh, Don Nixdorf has done some wonderful, wonderful uh, research at the University of Minnesota. Uh, one in four people, that's a lot of numbers. And uh, I don't think I have that uh, another study where they found that 10%, 8 to 10% of patients who undergo endodontic treatment at six months post-op tend to have persistent facial pain. So, uh, or persistent pain in that tooth. And that number goes down uh, around a year. So that's important to again, think of uh, if a patient undergoes a dental treatment, be it a filling or root canal treatment, or even an extraction and they come back and they have some uh, persistent pain and there's no objective sign giving it more time and unfortunately a lot more time, six to 12 months, rather than doing another procedure may be what we need to do. So uh, uh, why is that? Why do some patients have this pain despite, so some people definitely have pain, which is neuropathic pain, trigeminal neuralgia, where they get dental procedures and they get worse. But there's another set of patients where they have, they could have neuropathic pain or trigeminal neuralgia and they get, they need a filling. They have a decay, decayed tooth or a root canal. And now they get worse. Why does that happen? Because with trigeminal neuralgia, uh, even though the trigeminal nucleus is in the brain stem, the pain mechanism involves brainstem and part of the brain. So if you look at trigeminal neurology patients, often at times, it at some point, very quickly in the condition, uh, it involves the cortex. While if you look at other pain conditions, be it muscle pain or neuropathic pain, it involves thalamus uh, in addition to the brainstem. So there's distinction. So uh, often at times, if a patient has a sleep disorder, in addition to neuropathic pain, it's because the thalamus is involved. So we're, we're getting to know more and more about these conditions, which is, uh, which is helping us better treat these patients as well as better diagnose these patients. So... Uh, switching gears, I know I'm going a little fast because uh, there's a bunch of questions already, so I want to get to the questions soon. So 76-year-old male presents, uh, this is a patient I saw about two months ago, sharp stabbing pain in the lower right since a few weeks. It's, it's mostly there when I touch the cheek. Moving the jaw hurts, but not as bad. Location of the pain is intraoral over the Alveolar, alveolar ridge on the right, uh, has a history of implants, and it just started, okay? 
So he has a, he had an interesting medical history, polio in his childhood. Currently, he is not working. Uh, he's on opioids, as you could see, uh, some opioids. And he's reduced the dose of the opioids. So I found that was interesting. So if, if you look at his history, he went down on his morphine in the last three months and he really started having pain in the last few weeks. So uh, I think that's uh, it's playing a big role in this condition. So uh, uh, he fit the criteria of neuropathic pain in his case, kind of uh, did a workup overall. This apart from clinical uh, signs and symptoms, there's nothing else stood out. We actually decided to wait on to no treatment. I gave him some palliative treatments, uh, asked him to do some uh, uh, zinc supplements, which can help neuropathic pain. And uh, after about two three weeks he got a little better, okay? So, and you don't have to treat trigeminal neuralgia, but of course, uh, at times, you may want to treat it. So, uh, always stay in your comfort zone. Uh, again, a disclosure, uh, I do have uh, residency training in orofacial pain, so I will talk about treatment. If you're uncomfortable, reach out to a colleague or reach out to... Uh, Happy to answer your calls, uh, uh, but uh, don't overtreat it or don't go out of your comfort zone. Okay, so uh, so I diagnosed him with trigeminal neuralgia. Sorry, I said neuropathic pain. It's uh, it was really limited to V three. Offered him topical benzocaine. I asked him to do three times a day over kind of the trigger zone. And uh, he did it very sporadically. Saw him about three to four weeks later. He's like, it's definitely getting better. I don't think it's a topical. I think it's just time, which is making it better. So at times, uh, especially with complex medical history, I often take a palliative route, route and wait and see how things go. Okay. So, uh, and uh, I did tell him anytime you need a dental uh, treatment, major dental procedures, uh, I would advise to take uh, gabapentin 1200 milligrams, two hours prior, just to avoid any kind of uh, flare up of symptoms. Okay. So I'll switch gears to a different treat uh, case. So. 66 year old female left side facial pain started in started about in 2017 and uh, in 2017 she was given gabapentin it had helped pain alleviated completely for several years and then last year it started again she said it's she's unsure what triggered the pain uh, when I asked her if she's married, she said, yes, you have kids. She has a daughter. She's taking care of uh, her grandkids. And things are a bit stressful in the house. She's running around. She is a retired accountant. She starts her day at six o'clock in the morning. So not emotionally draining, but physically very taxing schedule she's had in the last several months to a year. So uh, she saw a neurologist in February, 2023. So uh, a few months before I saw her who started on uh, oxcarbazepine. And she was like, I did it for like two months. It had no benefit. She uh, also tried some Chinese herbs, didn't help. Okay. Uh, these were, her, I often use patient's words. This is. All, I find it's helpful to me. Uh, and this is what I mean. If it's trigeminal neuralgia, you know right by the history. It is sharp, hot, and so painful. Uh, I never know when it's going to come. And she started crying when she was describing this. The pain is like cutting, burning, so severe like electric shock. It's so awful. So, uh, 
So this is kind of the patient, okay? So in her case, shouting, brushing, sneezing, chewing, sometimes bending the head down. Uh, a lot of times I, I can't make sense of why these trigger zones are present or how the mechanism works. And uh, so the understanding is definitely still lacking on multiple fronts in this condition, even though we've known about this disease for hundreds of years now. Uh, she's busy, as we talked about, and I think it's playing some role. Uh, she does not drink alcohol. She drinks one tea per day. Uh, so she has a medical history of diabetes, cholesterol, hypertension. Uh, so, so this is kind of my workup again. So I did a history, clinical exam. She didn't have any nerve deficits. So I kind of told her, you have trigeminal neuralgia, and I think we should go back to gabapentin. Okay, so she was like, gabapentin, uh, yes, it had helped me in 2017. I was like, yeah, that's why I want to go to gabapentin. Otherwise, oxcarbazepine is my first choice also in most of trigeminal neuralgia cases. Started her on gabapentin and saw her, let's see, oh, patient is, okay. Uh, I saw her after about three months and she's like one month. So I saw her last month. So she's all of June, she said she's suffering. She was miserable. She was like first or second week of July. It was like an on off switch. She's like, my pain level went down in frequency and intensity by like 60, 70%. And just with gabapentin, no other kind of treatment. So uh, in her case, it's really a top-down intervention, as you could see in this, uh, my uh, slide. Uh, often at times, the previous patient was more a bottoms up where I asked him to do some palliative uh, topical medication. So uh, depending on the patient, depending on the medical history, depending on the patient's suffering, you got to kind of pick uh, a strategy. And she did great with the, that intervention. So next step is really uh, another three months, I'll keep her on gabapentin and see if she continues to improve where uh, 28, 29, my goal is like 27, 28 days in a month, she has no pain. So uh, that's kind of goal. If it's not enough, I may add an anti, another anti-epileptic or an antidepressant. So there's different modalities which can help. There's data about the very limited data, but there's limit data for using topical medications. Uh, I'm a big believer in topical medications. They help, uh, they don't have side effects. Uh, if you look at studies, it, the science is very limited. Uh, again, the financial incentive is limited for those uh, self-care supplements, again, a uh, lot of options. Like Magic Johnson's, said all kids need is a little help, little hope, and somebody who believes in them. That's a big uh, showing empathy to these patients. Uh, that's um, my philosophy and it should be everybody's philosophy. It's extremely important and extremely helpful. Uh, uh, I took this from Practical Neurology. Dina Kuruvilla wrote this uh, really good paper on headache. It was really on headache, but this really applies to neuropathic pain, trigeminal neuralgia, uh, and there's uh, certain modifications. If, if patients have nausea or kind of more uh, neural autonomic symptoms, they feel a little dizzy. I, I always find magnesium and butter burr works better if it's muscle pain or kind of they have uh, more constant pain, they feel weak, I find zinc helps, uh, magnesium helps. So uh, again, try, try to try them. 
Uh, and uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised how well a lot of complementary medicine works. Uh, I'm certified in acupuncture, so at times I do involve acupuncture, especially when patients have neck pain or poor sleep. Uh, so this number of options. <clears throat> so uh, going back to our patient, I started her on gabapentin 400 milligrams two to three times a day. I stopped her oxcarbazepine uh, and I told her I may do some uh, topical medications or uh, botulinum toxin or medic different medications. I usually write this down to her patients. So she came back earlier this month and she was like, things are a lot better. Okay. Uh, and her words were, it zinks sometimes. And I, it's really at the end of gabapentin. Uh, even though we know gabapentin doesn't work as needed, I have a number of patients who, who tell me this, that as soon as six to seven hours happen, I, they start having this pain. So uh, I did. I had asked her to be on like 1200. She found it was giving her uh, side effects. So. So, so to conclude, the perception of orofacial pain, it's difficult. It's difficult because most objective tests are lacking. Okay. Uh, I had a patient who got into an accident and uh, this is on I-95, uh, a major highway in the Northeast corridor. And she was dragged by an oil tanker. She was in a passenger seat. And she was dragged for almost a mile. The oil tanker, uh, I don't know exactly how the accident happened. And I saw pictures of the car. It's completely demolished. Her, her boyfriend was in the hospital for like 25 days, multiple fractures. She did not get any fractures. She was bruised, but no fractures. And I saw her for like six, eight months. And she did not, she lost her lawsuit against the, the oil tanker company that uh, for damages, just because she had no objective signs. She had chronic kind of facial pain, headaches since then, which got better with treatment, but uh, her quality of life really went down. So, uh, so the perception, and that's a problem, the visibility of, we are so used to in medicine relying on objective test and orofacial pain is really a subjective phenomenon. We, uh, so uh, it's, it's challenging at times. Okay. Uh, the pain, the, the other challenge is pain is dynamic. It, uh, uh, it can get better. It can get worse with number of uh, interventions, with number of uh, influences. And that influence could be environmental. It could be uh, it, internal, meaning it could be sleep. It could be Tra uh, emotional trauma, psychologic, it could be autoimmune disorders, dysfunction. Uh, so it's important to kind of look at the big picture and then kind of come up with a plan. All right, we're ready for some questions. Absolutely. Dr. That's, thank you so much for this great presentation. It was so thorough and we're all so grateful, but we have a lot of questions. So I'm going to jump right into them. Okay. Um, is neuropathic facial pain related to complex regional pain syndrome? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, it's debatable if complex regional pain syndrome exists in the face head region. So the mechanism is neuropathic in nature for uh, for the most part, for complex regional pain syndrome. Uh, this is a syndrome where people have typically, uh, when somebody is in an accident, they injure their limbs, peripheral organs, uh, and they have pain along with increased temperature. Uh, so uh, there's a bunch of articles which talk about that it does exist in the face, jaw region. Uh, again, the lack of objective testing for these conditions 
makes it really difficult to draw conclusions. So uh, depending on who you talk to, to me, yes, it is a neuropathic pain syndrome compared to some other person may not agree with it and they may not be wrong in certain subset of patients. Exactly, very subjective. Um, from Neil, uh, wants to know, can neuralgia result from shingles and can tinnitus result as well from shingles? Yes, so post herpetic neuralgia is definitely a well understood uh, uh, disorder, pain syndrome, uh, more, again, happens more in uh, other areas of the body, but definitely uh, has been reported in the face region as well. Now, tinnitus is, uh, can it result from shingles or can it be associated? I think it can be associated with, with viral infections. Uh, again, very poorly understood. I have had patients where they get better, but I have had number of failures as well uh, of patients who have tinnitus. Uh, and I always tell patients, if it gets better, it was related. If it doesn't, it was not. And uh, that's not a good way of looking at things, but that's all we got so far. Well, you know, when you're look gathering data, once you can cross things off, you can go to the next thing. So... Okay, so from Kendall, you spoke about unnecessary dental procedures with TN. Uh, what type of procedures would typically be done? I know you mentioned a couple, but could you just review that quickly? So uh, a lot depends on what, so if a patient comes in, most of the times endodontics is kind of the big one or the common one. Endodontics and extractions are a common word where the x-ray looks unremarkable, we are suspecting a fracture in the tooth just because the pain is just so excruciating or so localized to the tooth and it's not the tooth. So, uh, and again, it depends on the individual who's treating the patient. Uh, so uh, if it does not, uh, if it does not clearly look like an odontogenic pathology, uh, the radiograph is unremarkable, then it really should be held off. Uh, wait if it swells up or if it really, uh, the patient develops fever. Uh, I know that's not a good way we really, in this day and age, we don't wait for swelling mm -hmm. to uh, appear, but uh, that may be the next best thing. Thank you. Um, Michelle wants to know, is trigeminal neuralgia and fibromyalgia related? No. So trigeminal neuralgia uh, typically happens in 50 years or older people. The, the pathophysiology of trigeminal neuralgia is, uh, that's a different lecture by itself. Uh, we don't know why it happens, but we have... Uh, there, uh, Steve Scrivani was one of my mentors and he used to always talk about trauma. The teeth uh, are kind of undergo trauma multiple times in the lifetime. So eruption, shedding, eruption, and then dentistry kind of, they undergo a fair amount of dentistry over their lifetime. So you're talking about trauma to the same system at least four or five times, but most of the times, 10, 20 times. So that predisposes this the trigeminal system to kind of uh, sensitization. So that was one thought, which I think makes sense. The second thought, which has been often 50, 60% of patients actually have vascular compression in the uh, on the trigeminal nerve root within the brain. So, uh, so, and those patients respond quite well to microvascular decompression compared to fibromyalgia, where really it's the, it's uh, a, a really poorly understood uh, mechanism, pathophysiology, at least with, with regards to which areas of the brain are involved. When it comes to trigeminal neuralgia, it's really the brainstem and the cortex, that's kind of the main areas involved compared to fibromyalgia. It's uh, So I don't think uh, 
uh, we're pretty sure they're not related. Thank you so much for a very thorough answer. Um, Ashley asked, it, it, so if there is no clear way to diagnose, how as a dentist do you determine what is the correct response to proceed with treatment? So, so before I, I ask a different specialist, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, I apologize. No, no, that's good. Uh, so I didn't say there's no clear way to diagnose. There's no clear objective test. So if you look at, I'm going to go back a, a few slides. So, so if a patient fits the clinical criteria, so this is the diagnosis, this is a clear way of diagnosis, trigeminal neuralgia. If they fit this criteria, they have trigeminal neuralgia. And if they fit this criteria, the bottom of your screen, they have neuropathic pain. So, uh, uh, unfor the unfortunate part is if they fit this criteria, uh, it takes, at times, takes time. So uh, a patient who has neuropathic pain in, I teach GPR residents, and it takes 15, 20 minutes compared to a patient who has odontogenic pain takes a minute. So you have to put in a little extra time to go over uh, multiple systems to figure out what's going on in that individual. So uh, it's just a matter of time and a little bit of practice. Uh, orofacial pain, I feel uh, often at times I don't have clear answers, but I, I tend to have clues as to what I don't know. Mm -hmm. So uh, That's perfect. Thank you so much, doctor. Um, the next question we have is uh, about that first case study you did. And Viet wants to know, if, did you have an MRI of the TMJ? Uh, so that patient, he actually had a M MRI of his brain and sinuses. This is, uh, he was referred by his ENT, which overall was unremarkable. So he didn't have effusion in the joint. He uh, uh, he. He has some arthritis generalized, but uh, overall the MRI was unremarkable. I didn't have CT scan and uh, I didn't take x-rays also. Perfect, thank you. Uh, there are quite a few questions regarding zinc supplements. Uh, Josette wants to know which zinc supplements do you recommend? Marlene wants to know how much zinc would you suggest to help with nerve pain um, and um, that people really want to know a little bit more about the zinc supplements, if you could expand so, on. So uh, I interchangeably use zinc, picolinate, about 20 milligrams, uh, uh, alpha lipoic acid, 600 milligrams. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to kind of share uh, literature, email me. Uh, or I can actually have uh, include that in these slides so we can kind of... Uh, I have some sort of a cheat sheet that I use. I'm happy to share that. So uh, when it comes to zinc, I typically use 20 milligrams of zinc picolinate. Uh, but I do tell patients to use it for like six weeks to give it uh, time. Okay, 20 milligrams per day? Correct. Perfect, thank you. Um, these questions were uh, during your presentation for, I think it was a 70 something year old male. Um, Hannah said, you mentioned topical anesthetic. Uh, did you prescribe benzo 20% topical or is that the same percentage as an over-the-counter? It's an over-the-counter. Okay. So something along the lines as Vol Volteron or something? Along no, the no. Benzocan is kind of uh, uh, a dental anesthesia or oral uh, for oral use. So right. if it's something which is okay for oral use, they can use it on the skin the vice versa doesn't work. So Voltaren is not, uh, at least uh, the uh, the company instructions say not to use it even on the face. So mm -hmm. although some of my patients use it with benefit. We can't control, unfortunately, what they do once they get home. <laughs> um, and I've had some great results, so. Good, okay. So Hannah asked, um, are there any other drugs that can have the same results as gabapentin without the side effects? And Dorade also said, 
can a general dentist prescribe gabapentin? Uh, so general dentists can absolutely prescribe gabapentin. Uh, there's data to show that at 900 milligrams of gabapentin, the side effect profile is extremely low. The therapeutic dose of gabapentin is 1800 to 2400. That's where the patient, the short-term memory loss, the anticholinergic mm -hmm. effects are much more troublesome. Uh, and of course, if it's a geriatric patient, you want to stay really low. I have had patients who are on like 600, 900 milligrams, much more commonly than 1800. So uh, there's a number of medications. Uh, it's a long list. Uh, just look up. Uh, there are guidelines on uh, medications for trisimal neuralgia. There's multiple papers talking about anti-epileptics, oxcarbazepine, carbamazepine, uh, gabapentin uh, have kind of similar efficacy, and then lamotrigine, uh, pregabalin have are kind of second tier. Baclofen is also second tier, uh, and then there's others including antidepressants, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, desipramine. <clears throat> uh, so anytime somebody comes in who has extremely poor sleep, I often go to a tricyclic antidepressant like uh, desipramine or nortriptyline, which are kind of selective. So the side effect profile is lower and they are great neuropathic pain med medications uh, and they help sleep compared to somebody who's sleeping well, I may start them on antiepileptics. Perfect. Thank you. Aditha asked, what is the prognosis if the neuralgia is not treated right away? Say, for instance, uh, after a year, if the patient did not have access to care. Uh, I don't have a good answer to that one. Uh, I've had a number of patients where they actually didn't have treatment for six, eight, 12 months and I've had results. And then I've had a few patients where they were doing well for a number of time and somehow uh, they started kind of getting worse. Uh, I had a 40 year, 37 year old female who I've seen her for like seven years. For the first three years, she did great on carbamazepine and botulinum toxin and all of a sudden, it just stopped working. And uh, the last two, three years, we have had uh, we have a neurologist in, kind of a neurosurgeon, as well as myself. Uh, we've, we've just struggled with her care. So we don't know kind of uh, overall uh, the course of the disease process. What we know is most trigeminal neuralgia patients tend to do well with medication slash surgical intervention. Uh, especially classic trigeminal neuralgia. When it comes to neuropathic pain, uh, definitely a lot more challenging. I, in my experience, it's a lot more challenging to manage neuropathic pain. Thank you for that answer. Um, Makor said, sometimes patients have a pain, I think they said in the chin, does transmit to temple area. I guess they're trying to determine if these can be uh, connected. Uh, so uh, everything is connected. There's always a possibility of connections. So you're always, I always tell my residents and I'll tell you, you, you're treating a person just because the pattern doesn't make sense doesn't mean it's not valid. So the patient's pain is real always. Uh, if it's pain in the chin, it could be neuropathic pain. It could be uh, a referral pain from a muscle. Uh, I had a, I have a 32-year-old patient who, who I've been seeing for almost now nine months. He has, he had, when he first came in, he had severe pressure in the middle of the face, around the nose, temples, uh, and his bite was off. Uh, and six to eight months of these symptoms, I saw him about nine months ago. And uh, with occlusal appliance and some nerve blocks, he's at a stage where his, his bite 
is better. I think it was just more a muscle, uh, a temporary scenario that the bite was off. The bite is dynamic. Sometimes it's off for some reason. But even this symptoms of this severe pressure, uh, it's like 80, 70, 80% better. And I've seen them about four times. So it's not as if we've done a lot of intervention. So uh, it's uh, at least with regards, I, I told Nathaniel, my patient, I was like, I still don't know why this happened. I know how to treat it, but uh, I really don't know why this happened. That's a, those idiopathics that are difficult to. Most of them are idiopathic. We kind of, uh, and I, I kind of really urge all of you to kind of a response to treatment is not a diagnosis. If they respond to prednisone or if, if they respond to anti-epileptic, so response to uh, anti-inflammatory or a steroid, corticosteroid doesn't mean it's inflammatory. A response to anti-epileptic does not mean it's neuropathic it, because a, there's a lot of overlap between mechanisms. That is a very important thing to remember. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Maria asked, does hemifacial spasm contribute to orofacial pain? She had both TN and HFS prior to DV D MVD. And once the facial spasms stopped, so did her facial pain, which was mostly supraorbital and infraorbital. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I really... Uh, I'll have to look up the literature on hemifacial spasms. Uh, I'll kind of, uh, I'll have to get back uh, on that. Sorry. Is that something Maria should reach out to you? Yes, us? happy to. Yeah, I can look it up. Yes, absolutely. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we just have a couple more questions. Um, and you must be getting tired, but we appreciate it. No, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I, lo I love questions. These are great questions too. We have such great attendees tonight. Um, Courtney asked, have you had success using lasers to treat trigem trigeminal neuralgia? Uh, I'm not aware. So I don't have laser in my office. I have a couple of friends who, who have lasers. I have a few physical therapists by my uh, office who do utilize laser. Uh, I cannot say for trigeminal neuralgia, but definitely for chronic pain, uh, chronic non-specific facial pain as well as muscular pain i've had i've seen successes now uh if you ask me is that success if you can i put a number i unfortunately cannot most of these treatments have efficacy of like 60 percent and in pain medicine 60 to 70 percent efficacy tends to be enough to qualify as a, a treatment modality. So anytime you, you utilize a treatment, if you get making six out of 10 patients better, I think you should utilize that, especially something like laser, which is non-invasive, it's really uh, uh, worth trying. Um, and another question is, you know, regarding medical histories, we take very complete medical histories and use such as the A1C or even thyroid blood work. Do you have you ever found a relationship with other systemic diseases and oral facial pain? Uh, yes, absolutely. It's a big one. So I practice in Connecticut and uh, I would say every month I have three to four patients who have Lyme disease. So uh, I think autoimmune disorders are really uh, huge in chronic pain, not necessarily just facial pain. Uh, and any time uh, I suspect autoimmune disorder, and even if their uh, different titers are normal, I often take a more conservative route rather than uh, aggressive. So conservative with regards to medications, procedures, uh, they just take a lot longer to get better so and i educate them that we have to be patient 
Thank you so much for this. All this, that was a lot of questions and you answered them all so well and beautifully. And we're so grateful to you, Dr. Chanwani, for the, a wonderful presentation. Uh, right. So many people in the chat are saying, great presentation. Is it available? Are the slides available? We want to see it again. Yes, uh, I'm happy to share. Uh, uh, we'll uh, send an email to... Should I, uh, should they send an email to me or Facial Pain Association? Both ways, I'm okay with it. Okay, perfect. Um, I, I'm I happy to share my slides. Thank you so much. I would like to let all of our attendees know, though, that this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available to you as a self-study option. So you can listen to this webinar all over again and Great. glean all that information that Dr. Chandwani was sharing with us. Uh, again, thank you so very much for an incredible presentation. We're so grateful for you coming tonight and taking it's the time pleasure. to share with us. We appreciate it. I'd like thank to you all for being here. Oh, thank you. And thanks to our attendees as well for being here. I'd like to share the verification code. It has been shared in the chat and you can see it on the screen. But if you're listening into our webinar, the verification code for this course this evening is FPA2023. Now, if you ha don't have a CE Zoom account and you signed in via a different way, just go and create that CE Zoom account and follow those verification code steps we've given you. Um, there will be an email from FPA if you signed up through them that they will provide you with the steps and information. If you signed up through CE Zoom and you're having some problems verifying and getting your, uh, your certificate, just um, reach out to help at cezoom.com and they will help you. Again, thank you so very much for coming, for your questions, and for your participation in the chat. We love that you came, and we all hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night.